was the real Homo habilis. Since this species was named, it's been a source of endless controversy. You see, most evolutionists view this fossil as kind of the perfect missing link between apes and man, even though they don't tend to use that language of missing links. In the human fossil record, we kind of see this break. On the one hand, we have these creatures that are called Australopithecines, and they are very ape-like. They have very long arms, they were probably doing a significant amount of climbing, though they were also bipedal, meaning they could stand upright on their two legs and walk like we do. They also had very small brains and they don't seem to have the sorts of centers in the brain that we use to develop language. Then, on the other side, we find these very tall, uh, long-legged fossils of Homo erectus, and Homo erectus appears to have been using tools and fire. So the question for evolutionists is how do we get from these Australopithecines to Homo erectus? And Homo habilis is usually the answer. So today we're going to dive into Homo habilis and explore the various fossils that make up this taxon and how this species was named and how we as creationists should view it. Our story begins in Tanzania. In 1931, Louis and Mary Leakey, who were famous fossil hunters, began working at Olduvai Gorge. And to kind of understand the context of these discoveries, what you should understand is that there is basically this whole rift system running through the eastern part of Africa. And that is because the different crustal plates that create that continent are actually pulling apart from each other, leaving kind of this gorge in between them. And that is called the East African Rift Valley. Now, a lot of famous hominin fossil sites are actually found all throughout this rift valley because as these continents move apart, they're exposing rocks that are normally buried way deep down underground. So we can actually look at the rocks and, and find the fossils that are in them. For a long time, the leakies were unsuccessful. They found lots and lots of stone tools, but barely any hominin fossils. So they had no idea who was making these stone tools. They began to change very incrementally in 1959 with the discovery of OH4. OH4 was the collection number that they gave to this fossil, and the fossil was a small fragment of a mandible or a jawbone, and a few isolated teeth. This kind of scrappy find was entirely eclipsed by the discovery of a nearly complete skull at Olduvai. The Leakies pulled out this massive cranium which they assigned to a new genus, Zinjanthropus, and they gave the fossil the nickname Zinj. Immediately they thought, this must be the toolmaker. But the discovery of more fossils later on kind of led them to actually doubt that hypothesis. Today we classify this fossil, OH5, under the genus Paranthropus, and it's pretty clear that it's not really human. It has a very small brain, it has a big huge sagittal crest running down the top of its head, it has these big flaring zygomatic bones or cheekbones, and gigantic molars for chewing up tough plant matter. The scientific community at large was pretty skeptical of Leakey's claim that Zinge had been making the stone tools at Olduvai, and Leakey soon began finding more fossils. One of the first of these was OH6, also discovered in 1959. But it was just a few pieces of the skull and a few teeth. The next year, in 1960, the Leakies found a small collection of bones which all appeared to belong to a single juvenile individual, probably about 12 or 13 years of age. These included a nice little jaw here, also with two parietal bones, so from either side of the head, and quite a few little finger bones as well. The parietal fragments became an important part of the discussion surrounding the skull because they could be used to estimate the cranial capacity of the individual, how much space he had in his brain. And these parietal fragments are from either side of the skull, right? You have two parietals, one on the left, one on the right. And there's only so many ways you can actually angle them to fit them together, which kind of gives you a rough idea of how big somebody's skull is. So there were a variety of estimates ranging from 590 cubic centimeters all the way up to 710 cubic centimeters. Somewhere, he was somewhere within that range. But that's interesting because first of all, this is a juvenile individual, right? So he's not an adult yet and his brain is still probably going to increase in size. And secondly, that's interesting 
because even that cranial capacity, which is relatively small, is still quite a bit larger, significantly larger than the cranial capacity which is typical for Australopithecines. The mandible also had a number of interesting different traits. One of these is that it didn't have a chin. So the bottom of his jaw didn't jut out, it sloped backwards. And that indicates that this is not a Homo sapiens. Uh, we also see that there's some kind of interesting differences in the relative sizes of the teeth to one another. And when we look at the molars and the premolars, which are these teeth in the back of the mouth, what we see is that they're relatively narrow compared to Australopithecines. Australopithecines tend to have very large and wide molars, and these seem somewhat distinct from that. When you reconstruct the jaw, it's a little bit crushed and uh, kind of fused together in a weird position, but when you take this part of the jaw and reconstruct it as it would have been in life, what you notice is that the tooth rows take a bit of a different shape from the modern human jaw. So we have kind of a more parabolic arc shaped jaw. This guy seems to have had more kind of these parallel tooth rows on either side and then a curve around the top. So a little bit of a different shape. For the leakies though, it was really that collection of finger bones which clinched the deal. This sort of fossil hominin, whatever basket you want to put it under, was the type of guy who had been making all these stone tools. And they thought that because apes tend to have relatively long fingers and short little thumbs, whereas humans have a relatively long thumb and shorter fingers, and that allows us to more precisely grasp things. This individual, they believed, also had that ability. Part of that, though, was based on the distal phalanx that they found. So the last bone at the tip of your thumb here, and it was relatively big and robust. And so they thought this indicated that this individual had a large thumb relative to its finger, so it's following this human-like pattern. Later studies showed that the distal phalanx didn't belong on the hand. It was actually a distal phalanx from your foot, your big toe. So, um, yeah. That, that definitely affects some of our conclusions about what was going on with the hand. So that collection of bones, the fragments of the skull, the mandible, and the phalanges, were all assigned to the specimen number OH7. Based on this skeletal material, and some other smaller finds that I didn't mention, the Leakies created a new species in 1964. They named the species Homo habilis, and that means handyman because they believed that he had been making all those tools. So in their paper, the Leakies detailed a bunch of different anatomical traits which they believe set Homo habilis apart from Australopithecines and also Homo erectus. They believe that this was this unique species and it had this unique mixture of traits which wasn't seen in any other species that had been named up to that point. And besides the fossils that I've mentioned specifically in this video, many other different fossil remains have been attributed to the species Homo habilis. So let's discuss how exactly we can understand Homo habilis from a creationist perspective. Now, first off, I have to note that creationists are widely divided on the issue. Some people want to argue Homo habilis is an ape. It's basically kind of like the Australopithecines, it's a non-human ape. Others want to say that Homo habilis is a mixture of ape fossils and human fossils put together into a fake species. Still others want to argue that the main Homo habilis finds are actually human. Now I've been involved in baromenological research trying to understand what fossils fall into the human kind and which fossils do not. And my research suggests that Homo habilis mainly falls into the human category. There might be a few different fossils that are assigned to that taxon which aren't human, but the majority of fossils that are in that species Homo habilis seem to be human. And my research has looked not only at the features of the skull, but also the features of the rest of the skeleton, the postcranial features. And based on both of these, Together, it seems that Homo habilis fits best within the human kind. The conclusion that Homo habilis was human is also supported by what we know about their brain structure. You see, we can actually look at fossil endocasts, which are basically impressions that the brain leaves behind on the inside of your skull bones. And we can use that to infer what a brain, their brain would have looked like. And we know that Homo habilis appears to have had 
and expanded Broca's area. And this is basically a bulge in your brain which controls the formation of speech. And this bulge is not present in apes like chimpanzees or australopithecines. And so its presence in Homo habilis suggests that Homo habilis could have been creating speech. Endocasts of Homo habilis reveal that it also had a well-developed Wernicke area. And this area is involved in interpreting speech. So when you hear someone talking to you, how you exactly decode that in your mind. So these together suggest that Homo habilis may have had an advanced human-like ability to create and understand speech. The strong association between Homo habilis fossils and stone tools also suggests that they were human. As a whole, the stone tool record actually predates the appearance of other human forms like Homo erectus, and so this seems to indicate that Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis were making tools before we see the tools made by Homo erectus. So that together also once again indicates that Homo habilis has a somewhat advanced cognition. So in conclusion, a lot of questions remain. We still don't know as much about Homo habilis as we do about some other hominin species. We don't know whether Homo habilis is human or not. I think that the evidence suggests that it is, but a significant number of creationists still disagree on that. So we still need more research into that very basic question. We also need more um, research into the limb proportions of Homo habilis. And generally, we just need more skeletal material so that we can get a better characterization of what Homo habilis really looked like and how it differed, postcranially especially, from other species in the genus Homo. And then also, we would like more research into the subject of whether Homo habilis is a different species from Homo rudolfensis. Are those two different things? Are they the same species? Are there more species than just those two? Who knows? But generally, just to summarize what we know about Homo habilis, there are a core of fossils that are believed, basically by most scientists, to represent the species Homo habilis. That includes the old divine material, KNMER 1813, and some of those fragmentary partial skeletons that we talked about. And so generally, Homo habilis appears to have had a larger cranial capacity than Australopithecines, seems to have had a human-like brain, but it seems to have had a somewhat Australopith-like um, postcranium in certain respects. And so really, Homo habilis remains somewhat of a mysterious mosaic taxon. And hopefully, further creationist research can illuminate exactly who the true Homo habilis was. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like and subscribe.